It's been a long time since I was up here. Uh, really, that's by choice, and that's uh, one of the things probably uh, that conveys a little bit of my message today as well as about, you know, testimonies and, and some of the things that you see on your, your sheet. But I'm glad to be here. Pastor Bobby asked me to come up, and uh, initially I said, no, Nick can do it. And uh, they did some, well, Nick was afraid to arm twist, and Bobby just said, hey, I think you should do it. So I, I said, okay, I guess I got to do it. So I'm glad to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Marty. Yeah. No, I am. I mean, you'll see. When, when I get to my test, I'll, I'm going to have a testimony here, and then maybe you'll understand why I said what I just said. So I hope so. Um, so I do. Thank you all for being here. And those who are watching the live stream, perhaps even Pastor Bobby, you know, welcome. Uh, <laughs> The past four weeks, Pastor Bobby has been preaching from a series called The Distinctions of Crossroads. And it's been a very valuable time explaining who we are and what makes us tick as a church. And so far, he's made it through four lessons. And in the fifth one, that's called Transformation Involved Church, which is going to be coming up next week, he will do that upon his return. So he's done four, and he skips a week, and he's going to do his fifth one next week. So what you call this is an intermission. So today's the intermission, so go out in the lobby, get some drinks and candy, and come on back here, and it'll be fun. But there's none out there, so just enjoy. Thanks for being here with me today. During each message that he's preached, from the very first one, as soon as he started preaching, I heard or, or saw the word testimony come in my mind. And really, I thought that was just for me because I kind of like that. And, but then the second message came and testimony came. And then Bobby asked me to preach. And it's like, yeah, I need to do this because I know what I have to talk about, testimony. Um, but... I believe, I believe that any church that follows the same distinctions of crossroads will, it'll, it'll be one of these things that if you, if you operate in these things, you will operate and feel like you need to share your testimony, that it just bubbles up inside you. And I'm not specifically saying, you know, the testimony that says like, you've accepted Jesus, you know, that's great. That's a wonderful, wonderful testimony. Please, uh, there's no shortchanging that. It's awesome. But I'm referring also to sharing a testimony of how God has or is demonstrating himself in your life and how powerful that is. So think about this question. Whose testimony has affected you and why? The power of a testimony is important because it's very, very unique. And these stories affect people because lives change when people talk about Jesus. And we know that uh, both churches and ministries excel, like greatly excel, in educating people through sermons and Bible studies. How many Bible studies or three-point sermons did Jesus lead? He spoke in parables because there's power in storytelling. Stories, well, they define us. And it's not just what did you come through that matters, but the who and what actually came through you. Your testimony is about what God has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. Yeah. Yes, it's, it is about that moment that you came to Christ, no doubt. But it's also about the moments of revelation that come after you became a believer. You know, the times that God is working, that he's molding, and that he's moving in a particular season. Your testimony can actually become a message of hope to someone who's sinking. Think about it. 
People have learned and understood various things through stories since the beginning of time. And these stories that you have are tools that, that God has given you to utilize. And he's uniquely equipped you and a story within you each time so that they can be shared with others. So use them to help explain and demonstrate the truths of the gospel message. Let your experiences, let your challenges, and your revelations be something that you give to both inspire believers and plant seeds into non-believers' lives. Now, before we begin looking at issues that hinder us from sharing our own testimonies, please know that they are authored by God for his glory and our good. These stories, both large and small, are designed to be shared. Not kept within, but shared. But unfortunately, this last point about sharing is where many people get hung up. So let's look at some of the difficulties when someone feels the need to share your testimony or their testimony. So I was an engineer, so I like statistics. So let's consider these statistics. 90% of Christian believers feel they should share their faith. 90%. So when you look at this room right here, the majority of this room feel that you should share your testimony and share your faith. But only 40% invite someone to church. So we've just eliminated half the room who feel like they should invite someone to church. And check this out. Only 3% share their faith with an unbeliever. 3%. So call me crazy, but 3% seems like a very small number of ambassadors into a rather large world. Hey, and I'm not criticizing. Sometimes I'm part of that 97. So I'm speaking to me too. Charles Spurgeon, he's an old father of the faith, he was known as the prince of preachers. And he used a metaphor for whenever someone shared their testimony. And he called it singing in the night. So listen to what he said about the power of sharing your testimony. And I quote, Try and sing in the night, Christian, for that is is one of the best arguments in the entire world in favor of your religion. I tell you, we may preach 50,000 sermons to prove the gospel, but we will not prove it half as well as you will by singing in the night. Let that soak in for a second. I really like the imagery of that metaphor. Singing when everything around you is dark. It's like observing the sunrise on a dark, cold morning as the light crests over the horizon and it begins to warm and reveal the glory around. Can you picture it? Do you know what I'm saying? So why would we refrain from testifying of God's goodness and grace right now. Although there are more than what I've put on the list for you today, I want to examine three reasons why we don't share our testimony. The first is your fear of man is greater than your fear of God. So let's face this head on. Most people struggle with the fear of rejection. We don't want anyone to insult us, to ridicule us, or even turn away from us. 
And that's really natural. We all have it. But on the other hand, Jesus said something very interesting. In Matthew 10, verses 32, 33, he says, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whomever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Hmm. Interesting. So how can we overcome this issue? How do we do it? And I wish, I would love to tell you, hey, it's simple, it's a piece of cake, just do it. I'd love to be able to say that. But the truth, however, is that it begins with a small amount of faith and a small amount of trust in God. The true disciple of Jesus will ask for strength from the Holy Spirit to overcome this first hurdle. And let's remember that God saved us from a worse fate than anything else which man could do, which includes being mocked, being ridiculed, being ignored, or even left abandoned. Think about it. A second reason is that you think your testimony is boring. It's just boring. Why are you talking? <laughs> the one thing the devil wants to convince you is that you don't matter. You really don't. You don't matter. You don't matter. There's nothing special about you, and you're just plain vanilla. But I'm here to tell you that's ridiculous. Completely and totally ridiculous. God says that you are the apple of his eye. That's found in Psalm 17:8. In Luke 15, 7, it says, heaven itself rejoice when you accepted Jesus. And at times when you feel, felt rejected, God says you are his. His. And there's many more verses which I could just pull out to try to show you how special you are. The devil wants to lie to you and say you're not. But God says you're amazing. You are not boring. People sometimes disqualify their testimony as small or less powerful, and therefore they believe it's not worth sharing. And they believe that they need to be delivered from an addiction and a dark past that they have, or have this some like dramatic transformation from moving from darkness into light. However, just because you came to Christ at a young age or because the gospel just like made sense to you, and it always has, that doesn't mean your story is less significant. Listen to me, everybody. You have an awesome story. Each one of you have an awesome story. Own that. Every testimony is a tribute to God's power. And it's only by his power that we step out of death into life, that we're transferred out of darkness into the kingdom of light, or are supernaturally sustained and delivered from the world's trials. So we need to pray, God, teach me, tell me what to say, so that we can communicate this message to the world. Let's make that 3% higher. So the last reason that I chose is that you think, <clears throat> you think people would rather respond to facts and knowledge, but you're no theologian. You don't know enough. You're no theologian. But here's a question for you, a little thought provoker. How many of you have to know everything about electricity before you use it? Who here sits in darkness waiting to learn the nuances of electron flow, the combined effects of both Kirchhoff's rule and Ohm's law, and is it red, black, or green that's hot? Or do you simply just get up and turn the light on? Which one? Turn the light on or knowing everything? I'm willing to bet it's just getting up and doing it. See, having an abundance of knowledge is great, 
but many who reject Christ do so out of a personal experience and reasons much deeper than simply knowing facts. In returning to Spurgeon's quote, your testimony may be a more powerful argument for Christ than all of the intellectual arguments in the world. Even Paul said so. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, he says, and, it was, and so it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. So finally, in this first section here, just know that there are many other reasons. Yet, I chose these because they seemed almost universal to all the, all the research I was doing. And honestly, at times, it still rings true with me. You know, the missed opportunities where you should have shared, but you didn't. It happened to me last week. I told one person here about what I didn't do when I know God was leading me. So I'm not above this either. But sharing stories of God's goodness is a gentle, loving way to defend the faith and explain why we have such hope in Jesus. Okay? All right, I don't want to camp here on like all the negatives, like what we're not doing. Uh, but I want you to recognize that there are common limitations and ask God for the wisdom, the strength, and the words to overcome our internal objections. I think by showing these negatives, it lets you know that you're not unique. We're all in this together. It's not like it's just you who've got the issue. We all have it. But we recognize it, and we make some changes because there's a world out there that needs inspiration and a Heavenly Father who can provide purpose, he can provide peace, and he can provide healing. So let's look at some reasons for sharing your testimony. Let's start with this one. Has Jesus saved you? And if so, you have a story to tell. We should all learn how to tell our testimonies because you may never know the lasting effects you have when you share what Jesus did in your life. And rest assured, when you do share, the, sort, the story doesn't just end with you. So two quick examples uh, that demonstrate the unto from sharing their individual testimonies are, are, I'm bringing from the Bible for you. And the first one is a Samaritan woman in John 4, and the second one is a demon-possessed man in Mark 5. In each case, their testimonies had three ingredients to them. And the first was that they stated what they experienced. They told. They told somebody. The second was that they encouraged people to meet this man for themselves. Personal meet. And the third thing was that the listeners believed and realized that he, Jesus, was the Savior of the world. But note that in both cases, it started with one person, simply one person. Each one had a very short encounter with Jesus, very short encounter with Jesus, but it ultimately led to thousands of people believing in him. So these two stories show how when the Spirit wills it, a revival can ignite anywhere and at any time. So share your stories. Share them. So the first reason that we should share is your story is unique. Psalm 66 verse 16 says, Come and listen, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he did for me. 
No two people's testimonies are exactly the same. Your testimony may have been extreme and radical, or it might have been a calm profession of true belief. Both are relatable because God's love and mercy reach the lost, whether they are loud and boisterous or quiet and reserved. And your testimony does not have to be a story of salvation alone. Your testimony can be examples of God's continued faithfulness during your life. Has God saved your marriage? Tell someone. Has God given you the strength to break an addiction? Tell someone. And my goodness, has God shown up at the exact moment to make a difference in your life where you knew there was no other way? If yes, then let somebody know. No one can diminish your testimony. People may not believe it, but they cannot disprove it. It's yours. So don't make things complicated, all right? If Jesus redeemed and rescued you, then say so. Go tell your story. It can even be a simple statement like the man who was born blind in John chapter 9. When asked, he just simply said, I once was blind, but now I see. Quite a simple, powerful testimony. His story is unique. The next reason is, the next reason is people love to hear stories. They do. You do. I do. No matter who you are, humans thrive off connection. We are wired with a fundamental need to survive and thrive in this world. Part of the way we connect with people is through stories. Think about it. We go to movies. We watch television. We listen to the radio. We read books to hear great stories. And these stories can provide experiences and people that we want to emulate. They also give us the opportunity to see from another person's point of view. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, it says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. A testimony. It's evidence of how we live. So when our stories point to Jesus, we show others how to walk alongside him and how he is the reason for every, every good thing in our lives. Testimonies about God's faithfulness show people that the only way to live is with and through him. The third reason is it removes fear, it provides courage, and is a weapon. One of the greatest spiritual weapons we have <clears throat> is our testimony. So open your mouth, valiant warriors. Do so. We sang about it this morning from Revelation 12, verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Yeah. Amen. This verse is a spiritual warfare go-to scripture for Christians, and it applies to anyone who testifies to God's work. Satan's demise comes from Jesus' sacrifice and when we share our testimony. And we can be assured that God uses both to defeat evil. When you open your mouth and you declare the faithfulness of God, your testimony becomes a weapon, a sword in your hand, and an instrument of power to set captives free. Fight the good fight of faith. I'm looking at 1 Timothy 6.12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Your testimony is one way to fight the good fight of faith 
and take hold of eternal life for ourselves and others. And when I speak about what God did in my life, I also remember all of God's goodness. When I recount what he did in my past, it gives me even more faith and courage to live in the present and consider the future. Amen. So at this point, I want to share a testimony, a personal testimony. And I'm going to give you two today. And I wanted to use mine simply because it's my testimony. And it's not because I think I'm pious or holy or, or more special than, that's probably doesn't, sorry, better than anyone in this room. It's just my testimony. And when I was, I'm telling you to share, I'd feel like a fraud if I didn't share. So, let me take you on a journey of how I came to be here and how God demonstrated this point of removing fear, providing courage, and being a weapon. So, prior to coming here as a pastor, I was an engineering manager for a local company for a long time, like, well, well over 23 years. And during my tenure there, Pastor Bobby wanted me here. Uh, he had been asking me for at least 15 years to come take this role. But each time he asked, I politely pushed it to sometime. <laughs> yeah, sometime, Bobby. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Sometime in the future. Now, I didn't know that my job was my marketplace church. And I... I knew that I was called to be there. And God richly blessed me with people and things. And I saw him moving on my behalf and the behalf of others. But I also knew there was something else going on inside. But I was avoiding it as much as possible. In fact, I was burying it as much as I possibly could. On July 2022, Pastor Bobby, Wanda, my wife Paula, and I, we had dinner where he once again popped the question. Yeah, the, the, you know, the question, when will I come on staff? But this time, he suggested a three- to five-year plan, a transition plan that it would take three to five years to get me in this role, which I agreed to, but inside I was going, what I'm hearing is, this is going to be five years minimum, and I'm going to do everything I can to extend it out even further. I knew it. I mean, I knew it. See, inside, I had the fear. I had a lot of fear about making the change. I was full of fear. You know, questions like, how am I going to support my family? Um, how's insurance work in this? How do you, I don't know how insurance works. And... I was thinking, I'm a trained engineer. I'm no theologian. So, you know, that plays into the previous list. I didn't see how it was going to work. Didn't see it. Yes, sir. This move would conveniently take a very long time because I was pushing it as far down as I possibly could. Y'all are good people and everything, but, man, I just, I was afraid. So the very next week, my family went to Buffalo for a vacation. And one day we visited Niagara Falls. Yeah. Yeah, the girls, the girls wanted to take this thing called the Maid of the Mist boat ride. <laughs> which I really didn't care about either way. I'm like, whatever. Um, but I went anyway. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Maid of the Mist likes to go right in the middle where it's all bubbly and you can hang out for a while. So, you know, I went and the girls are going up and I'm the last one up and I hear God say to me, I want you to do three things. I'm like, yeah, God, what is it? You know, I like take a picture, you know, whatever. So, 
So, you know, post on Facebook, which I never, ever do. So I'm like, what is it, God? He says, go to the top, stand in the middle, and don't hold on to anything. Okay? Now, I'm thinking that's cool because that, that I was like, phew, because I can do that. You know, I, I've got really good balance. And when I'm on a canoe, I stand up in a canoe because I want to see where we're going. So I was like, this is not going to be a big deal. So as we approached the mouth of the falls, it was, to say the least, intimidating. The roar of the water was deafening. This doesn't do any justice. The roar of the water was deafening as 44 million gallons of water per minute is falling over the edge, creating 320-foot walls of water terror. Okay, it's just, it's crazy. Um, the ground, which I was standing on, which is the boat, you know, it was rocking back and forth. And I was standing up, and the balance is good, but I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. It sh the, everything shook and swayed. And I was in the middle of all of that, just getting wet. Just water was coming all over me. And it was, honestly, it was cool. I was like, this is cool. And I said, all I could think of was Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments. That's it. The truth. That's all I can think about. And I said, God, this must have been what the Israelites experienced when they crossed the Red Sea. And boom. God said yes. And they were afraid to take the first step too. I knew, I knew instantly what I had to do. I knew it. So, when getting off the boat, I came up to Paula and I was like, honey, I gotta quit my job. And she said, okay. And I'm like, no. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, honey, like, I gotta quit my job now. And she said, Okay, and that, so the rest is history. That was like going to Thursday, Saturday we came home, Sunday came to church, and I was like, hey, Bobby, we, wanna, we, gotta, we gotta have a talk because uh, we, we gotta talk about some things. And so we went to lunch, and, and Bobby's trying to be really cool. Like, I said, I said hey, hey, Bobby, how soon, how soon are you ready for me to do this, this whole thing? And he's like, how soon do you want to do it? And I said, <laughs> and I said I'm going to quit my job tomorrow. And he's like, oh, you know. <laughs> I'll never forget that. So it's true. Like the next day, I put my notice in and uh, put my notice in, gave him the whole month of August. And by September, uh, I, w I started here. Like, September 7th, I think. So, the Israelites' testimony of their experience at the Red Sea provided me with the courage to act and actually became a weapon for me to defeat this colossus of fear that I had. It did. So, I hope my testimony gives you a little bit of insight and understanding about who I am but what the power of what, the power of what God can do in a life. I'm just one little story. You've got stories too. Thanks. So number four, let's get back on track. I got time to go. So it creates transparency and makes faith permanent. The more we're honest about our own mistakes we've made, the more other people can relate to us. Hiding things keeps people at arm's length. It does. But sharing brings them closer into a warm and real conversation. Your story can be a key to unlock someone else's prison. Confession is a vital link to faith and we are saved, and our faith grows because we confess Christ. Consider this real-life example. A godly man led 
a rich young man to the Lord. And he stayed with the man for a while, the, the man of God for a while. And a day came where the man had to return back to his wealthy lifestyle. And he told the godly man that he was afraid he might slip back into his old habits. The godly man told him to go tell the first ten people that he saw that he'd become a Christian. And if he did, he wouldn't have to give up his bad friends because they'd give him up. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. When he went home and he witnessed to the first ten, he was recognized as a Christian, and those who wanted no parts of it got away from him. People need to see the power of God in your life. And we need to share that through our testimony. Amen. Note, words can be optional when sharing it. Others should see Christ alive in you through your love, your joy, your peace, and all the other fruits of the Spirit. You will not likely share your testimony every day, but you should daily live out your testimony so that people see and want to know more. What makes you tick? So the last reason is it dispels unbelief and glorifies God. When someone shares their testimony, it really isn't about them. No, it's about God and all that his work in them. Sharing a testimony can be sharing a gospel message, like I said, or it can be a story of God's abundance and favor. Either way, God and his majesty is promoted, and the testimony glorifies God. Psalm 96, verse 3 says, Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous work among all the peoples. So if for no other reason, we should tell people about Jesus so everyone knows what he's done, what he's capable of doing, and shows the world what a wonderful God we have. And serve. Acts 1 8, very familiar verse to us. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Everybody longs to see God tangibly moving in and through their lives, and when doing so, the stories build faith. The stories build faith and destroy unbelief. So I have one more personal testimony to share that most people in this room uh, have not heard. There might be like five, I think I counted five here right now that might know this story. So back in 2001, Crossroads sent out our first mission team to Narin, Kyrgyzstan. It was an evangelistic crusade supporting the mission of evangelist Brent Regis. And one of my tasks as the team lead, which I had no idea why I was chosen to lead the team, there were so many other well-qualified people to do so. However, one of the tasks that I had was to film the nightly crusades from the stage. Just like in Acts 1-8 where we are expecting to receive God's power, Brent made a call for people to place their hands on any body part that needing, needed healing, and people did. Right, Danny? <laughs> yeah, just like that. We we're going to talk about that in, in staff meeting. <laughs> No, and, and people did. So Brent said, hey, anyone who needs healing, put your hand on your body part that needed healing. The problem, however, is what was I supposed to do? You see, up to that point, I believed in healing. I did. But I was very skeptical about it, to say the least. And for a year and a half prior to this point, I had a chronic neck pain where I could not turn my head to the left I just without having a great deal of pain. Um, ibuprofen was my friend, and we met and talked multiple times a day. 
a lot, and we just we were very good friends. I went to the doctors. I had many people pray for it. Like I said, there's about five of you in this room who did. Um, and even broke down and went to a chiropractor. And if you know me, you know that's I'm not a big fan. But I went to a chiropractor because I wanted some relief. Anyhow, no relief, nothing, ever. So fast forward a year and a half, here I am. I'm standing on stage over 6,600 miles away from home. And yeah, I, really, I wanted to be healed. I did. But I'm one of the stage guys. You know, I'm standing up here. What am I? I'm here for them. What am I supposed to do? I'm, so, you know, I'm supposed to be the guy full of faith, ready for anything. I'm here to help you. I'm not supposed to be the guy who's down on the floor needing the prayer. My faith level was very, very low. So, when I wanted healing, I slowly, I was filming, I slowly raised my hand, put it on my neck, kind of act like I was yawning. <laughs> yeah, I know, it was really pathetic. I mean, it really was, and it's not, I didn't say prophetic, I was very pathetic, I was like, yeah, I can't, I can't turn my head, so I'm like, yeah, it's crazy. Brent prays, and nothing happens, nothing. I'm sure that really made me feel really good, but nothing happened. I went to bed, next morning I woke up, and all the pain had vanished. Every bit of it. Yeah. Amen. I kept testing it out like I was some bobblehead toy, you know. But nope, nope. It was, it was gone. And that was almost like 23 years ago. Yeah, it was gone. I asked God a few days later. I said, hey, <laughs> Hey, why'd you, why'd you wait until I was halfway around the world to do this for me? A whole year and a half, you know, why? And he said, if I had healed you while you were home, you would have attributed it to doctors or anything but me. Oh, yeah, it really hit. It hurt. It hit, but he was right. He was right, and now my faith is solid. You know, it doesn't take a year and a half to learn some lessons from God. Praise Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, but it also reminded me of the miracle in John chapter 9, verse 3, where Jesus said, this happened so that the works of God would be displayed in him. God's timing might seem off to us at times, and we question, like, why doesn't it line up with our desires? But his timing is perfect. The testimony of my healing demonstrates how much he wants to dispel our unbelief and gives us experiences where we can show that he deserves glory, his glory. All right, my list is finished, so we're heading down the home stretch here. These five reasons to share your testimony should encourage you to tell real stories of God's redemptive work in your lives. There are many more scriptures to echo each of the things I've already said, as well as there's other verses for further reasons, motivations why you should care about the power of your testimony. In heaven, we will continually praise God. Nick mentioned a little bit about that earlier. So isn't it enough reason to give him glory now? And with each testimony, we bring a piece of heaven down here to earth. So why not tap into that glory now? Let's do it. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power. And you will be his witnesses here, there, and everywhere. Your testimony is something uniquely yours, which you can share with people you already know and with people you don't know. And when you share it with people that you know, it'll travel fast because they'll share it in your own circles of people that you know. And, you share, and when you share it with people you don't know, the good news travels far because they end up taking that and sharing it with people outside of their circles. 
God wants his gospel to travel fast and far. So share your testimonies, people. So the next time you were asked about your testimony, remember that God gives you a collection of these stories. Stories that give a purpose and need to be shared with others. Each story can relate to how the power of the gospel is alive, unchanging, and ongoing. So therefore, I ask you, who in your life needs to hear your testimonies? Who have you shared your testimony with that you need to keep praying for? And also, are you asking God to open your eyes for more opportunities to share? Trust me, he will gladly give them to you. Are you willing to be his spokesperson? At this point, I'd like to call up the prayer team to come on up and join me. I encourage any of you who needs prayer to come and receive prayer from these people. If you have a need, a request, or simply want to know more about Jesus or have his power demonstrated in your life, please come on up. Do not leave here the same way that you came in this morning. Don't. So let's pray. Father, today I ask that for those who want it, inspire us to share your good news. Show us that what you are doing in our lives is not by circumstance, but by design. Let us understand, with our testimonies, we unlock and display a multitude of your character traits revealed through our lives. Bless our words, and when that is not enough, let us loudly testify with our actions. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.